Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Levinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating again with our friends at NYRB Classics for a discussion of their new reissues of William Gaddis's classic novels, The Recognitions and JR, featuring Tom McCarthy, Lydia Malay, Joshua Cohen, and moderated by Dustin Illingworth. Uh, while the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in our days. And I want to give a huge thanks to Tom and Lydia and Josh and Dustin for joining us this evening. So just some housekeeping before we get started. You should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button here at the bottom of the screen to submit them. We will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. Um, there's also a chat button down here where I'm going to be posting a link to buy tonight's books from our store. Uh, caveat for tonight's event, we are all at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve them quickly. And uh, while this is our last virtual program for the fall, we'll be picking back up in January with a host of new events. Um, one program that I do want to point out on January 12th, we will be hosting George Saunders for the launch of his new book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. Uh, tickets for that are on sale now, and I'll be posting a link to that in the chat below. Uh, and finally, I want to thank the team at NYRB, Nick, Abigail, Linda, and Edwin, for helping put together such a terrific virtual event series starting all the way back in April. Here's to more in the spring. So now a little about today's panel, and we'll get started. Tom McCarthy is the author of four novels, Remainder, Men in Space, Sea, and Satin Island, and several works of criticism. In 2013, he was awarded the inaugural Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction by Yale University. Lydia Malay has written more than a dozen novels and story collections, often about the ties between people and other animals and their crisis of extinction. Her story collection, Fight No More, received an award of merit from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2019, and her collection, Love and Infant Monkeys, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2010. And her most recent novel, A Children's Bible, was just named one of the 10 best books of the year by the New York Times. She lives in the desert outside Tucson with her children and boyfriend. Joshua Cohen's books include the novels, Moving Kings, Book of Numbers, Vitz, uh, Heaven of Others, and Cadenza for the Schneiderman Violin Concerto, the short fiction collection, Four New Messages, and the nonfiction collection, Attention, Dispatches from a Land of Distraction. Cohen was most recently edited, He, a collection of short fiction by Franz Kafka, uh, a new novel, The Net and Yahoos, will appear next year. And finally, Dustin Illingworth has written for the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, and The New York Times Book Review, among other places. Uh, Tom, Lydia, Joshua, Dustin, the stage is yours. Great, thank you, Hal. And uh, thank you again to Community Bookstore and to NYRB for giving us this, this great forum to talk about two amazing novels. And um, I wanted to kick things off, seeing as how I, I imagine a number of, of people tuning in today may have never read Gaddis before, but are you know extremely interested in kind of taking the plunge. I wanted to talk about his, his somewhat fearsome reputation that I feel like maybe uh, turns people off at first, um, that, that sort of famous inaccessibility uh, of Gaddis. So in preparation for this discussion, I read a couple dozen different um, reviews that critics have, have given to Gaddis over the years. Um, a, a few quotes here. Um, he's called quintessentially difficult by Jonathan Franzen, unreadable by George Steiner, comprehensive by Rick Moody, omniscient by Cynthia Ozick, pretentiously exclusive by John Gardner. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious what your own experience was like uh, your first time reading Gaddis. What, what was it like reading him? Um, and what do you think readers should perhaps arm themselves with uh, to prepare for that first encounter with Gaddis? Tom, we can start with you. Well, I guess the first Gaddis book I read was Agape Agape, um, which is the shortest. But it was in the context, it was in a seminar on, we were reading Walter Benjamin's, you know, work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. We we're thinking around technology and Donna Haraway and it, it, it fit in very seamlessly or very, very uh, productively with these, with these other works. I mean, I think he's, he's part of a philosoph you know, philosophical tradition as our most interesting writers from Stern through Joyce, through Kathy Acker, so I've actually, I think the question of hardness is a bit of a kind of red herring. I mean, why, why shouldn't it be hard? No one ever complains that, you know, oh, the theory of relativity isn't reader friendly enough. I mean, you know, you've got to do a bit of work sometimes, but it, it pays off. <laughs> and, and why not? Why shouldn't we have to do a bit of work is my feeling. <laughs> I 
also feel that, that, you know, to some degree, you know, you can, it can be as hard or easy as you, as you wish it to be. That is, you know, you can immerse yourself in the language in different ways and sort of at different, different levels. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this sort of deconstructive um, sort of uh, effort necessarily, or this, or this, even an analytical effort. I, I had a when I first read Gaddis, I was in my early 20s and um, I just found him on a, on a list of books everyone should read <laughs> like in the 20th century uh, or something. And, um, and I just sort of, I didn't understand everything and I probably still don't as I read him, but um, the sort of, I don't know, the, the prickly sort of hedge of his language and especially dialogue uh, is, is just, it's just an interesting place to find yourself falling. You know, it's a it's an interesting um, texture to to kind of climb around in, and um, you know, and I think and I think there are just there's uh, as many different ways to read it um, as readers almost. And yeah, I don't think difficulty has to be has to be a barrier. Only if you only if you make it one. Yeah, I, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't think it's difficult. I think it's 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 the people who think it's difficult are people who haven't read it. I think, uh, uh, especially, I think the recognition is slightly different because of the tissue of illusion and reference and the way that you know the the narrative um, uh, or an expository prose and the dialogue is kind of bracketed out, right? Uh, but after that, from J.R. on, it's talk, and it's and it's you know classically American talk, and it's the noise of of all the voices coming at you on the street, or on uh, the radio, on television, and um, and I think that we're just very conditioned to deal with literary complexity in the form of sentences that need to be parsed by the clause and need to be understood in um, not just in, in the linear order in which a sentence goes to, to kind of put it together, but that the paragraphs proceed that way, that the sentences all go in a certain direction, the paragraphs all go in a certain direction, the chapters are arranged in a certain way that bring us kind of forward uh, through a story. And, and yet, you know, we have no difficulty leaving our house, or at least I don't, you know, and, and, and hearing all sorts of noise in the street and snippets of conversation and, 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 and nonsense actually. And we just, we walk through it and, 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 you know, sometimes there's nothing more pleasurable than hearing a part of a conversation out of context and just relishing a line because you don't necessarily know, you know, what its reference are. And so I, I think that if we, if we think about it differently and not maybe as piously, there, there not only wouldn't be that intimidation, but there also, you know, the, and you wouldn't get that reputation. But I also think that, that, that his books will not only unfold in, in a different way, in a more humorous way, but I think some of the, the messages that he's trying to send um, come through. And, you know, very quick, like I, how, how I first came to read it, is I first came to read him, in um, actually, I think where where Tom is now in, in Germany when I was, was living in Berlin, and and it's very interesting to be reading a novel of just Jr. is reading a novel of talk, um, you know, in a country that language is not your own. Great. Um, so I, I also wanted to talk about the concept of recognition while we're on the the, the subject of the recognitions, um, and it's. It's this moment of um, sort of charged consciousness that's maybe akin to um, Joycean Epiphany or, or Wordsworth's uh, Spots of Time. And I think for, for Gaddis, it seems to be a way of um, this, this idea of recognition, a way of sort of constellating significance in a world without much of it, with, with, with much insignificance, I should say. So there, there are only a couple of characters, it seems to me, that can really access recognition. And I think um, the strongest of those is Stanley, the Catholic uh, composer in the novel. Um, and he has this quote, he says, the devil is the father of false art. And that, um, I think that quote really begins to resonate and, and expand um, and, and gain additional layers of meaning as the novel goes on, uh, as, as Gaddis draws these, these different uh, comparisons between false art and false life or false living. Um, and I realize this is a very 
broad question, but I, I'm curious um, what you make of the role uh, of art in, in the recognitions. Um, Gaddis does so much with the idea of, of creation versus uh, original vision versus forgery, um, and originality itself being a, ro a romantic disease, is why it's um, as why its teacher calls it. What do you make of art in the recognitions, and what do you think Gaddis believes it's capable of in a world where um, it's not only difficult to create, it's difficult to even apprehend? Um, it, it, let's, let's start with maybe Josh this time. What do I make of it? I, I think that that there is a, um, you know, there's a deep sense of fallenness in Gaddis, of uh, fallenness and of belatedness, of kind of coming too late to a culture or coming too late to a, to an art form, uh, a sense of uh, a soiled purity, uh, a sense of a Gnosticism maybe, that because we can't achieve this this purity, we need to kind of, you know, befoul ourselves, you know, um, and, and, and maybe find some, you know, purity by going through the demotic, let's say. But, but in general, I think that, that you know, this is a very, uh, I take it on two levels. I think on one level, I, I, I do feel he, he felt um, born too late. Um, but I also think that, you know, he realized that everyone feels born too late. And he was satirizing that, um, that excuse, that sense that the, the way in which belatedness or feeling kind of too late for an authentic culture, whatever that means, kind of excuses you from attempting to make something. And it kind of gives you a get out of jail free card from, from being uh, vulnerable or exposed in that way. And um, with Gaddis, he's really seeing so 360 degrees around you know, his characters. And what's amazing, he's doing a lot of it through dialogue, which is, seems to be the craziest way to see around somebody. But, um, but, but he does really have that, that, you know, the person whom nothing is lost quality. And so because of that, I do think that there is a, a deep theological component to the sense of um, a fallen world. But I also think that he, he absolutely understands the way in which, especially popular culture, kind of excuses one from being serious. And that can both be gleeful and exciting and fun and sexy, but it can also be hollowing and, uh, and soul crushing. And I, 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 he wants to kind of come at it through all of those, through all of those ways. I also think that, that, that there is an instance where, um, you know, in painting and in music, which are the two kind of art forms that he writes Kind of the most about between JR and 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 recognitions. I mean, you have theater as well, but but really, it's you know painting recognitions and you have some you know music from JR and and it's it's the sense that these you know these are abstracted things that don't need to use language. Language is something itself that's fallen because everyone uses it, and so he does have a sense of 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 almost pitying self pity for oh you know how was I faded to this art form that uses as its materials the same shit that comes out of everyone's mouth. So it's hard to achieve a recognition in that, let's say. Lydia or Tom, do you have any additional thoughts there? Tom, how about you? I mean, I think in, in the recognitions, recognition is taking place at, uh, I mean, everywhere. It's all over the place. As, as Stephen Moore, the wonderful um, annotator of Gaddis points out, I think it's 86 uses of the of the term in the book. So even, you know, even the forgers use uh, the, the forgery recognition manual and um, tourists have got light meters that they're holding up to the daylight, which is, um, I mean, Moore points out that in Gaddis's working notes, he, he always linked that term with pattern, pattern recognition. It's all about pattern recognition. It anticipates our age of facial re recognition software and QR codes and so on. Um, and, and sure, I mean, it's, it's a fallen world. It's a world of too lateness, but this has always been the condition of literature and Gaddis knows this, right? I mean, the first novel virtually, Don Quixote is about too lateness, the condition of coming too late to experience, to kind of it, to experience it authentically. And Gaddis, I think he also gets um, that authenticity is, is, is a central fetish 
of Western culture that he gleefully sets about demolishing. I mean, I, I, I do not think the recognitions is, is issuing a call for a kind of some return to, to truth, a return to authenticity. I mean, I think, I think he's, I place him in a tr tradition running, you know, up to Adorno and back to Plato, you know, that, that, that or Aristotle or whatever that, that gets that, that um, man's condition is inauthentic. It is, it is divided, split, you know, decalé, experience is set aside from itself and, and art is the kind of the mode and the medium par excellence of, of navigating this but it's an unsolvable, it's an unsolvable condition. And so the task of art is, isn't to kind of resolve it or return us to some kind of kingdom of the authentic. It's, 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 to, um, it's to navigate our, our exile. Great. I always do get the sense both from, I mean, recognitions and JR. So, and I think this was one reason I, I like, I was so drawn to Gaddis when, when I was young um, and trying to, and trying to, you know, read, read books that were different than the ones I'd read in school. Um, Gaddis was not, you know, in the canon of, of what, I, what I read anyway at college or in high school. Um, and I think I really did what it was sort of this, you know, this sort of, um, this sort of insistence on aesthetic rigor. That was a sort of like the sort of idealism of aesthetic rigor, at least it sort of insisted on that and also was funny like he just you know and we can't forget you know the, the humor of Gaddis you know which which for me is in, in JR sort of ascendant but just but you know that the um that, that that always there's this it's sort of through the slyness of his humor that you get to the the world behind the dialogue and um and the other language that sort of you know, these characters that you don't see really directly, especially, especially in JR again, because I don't remember the recognitions closely enough, but also it's more prose and less of this sort of elusive um, dialogue. But he really, really sort of the, the, you know, there's pathos in it also, but just the, the way everything, the way you have to sort of um, go behind this dialogue through, the gateway of his kind of wry, dry humor to see what even um, exists, you know, sort of in the, uh, if there is this autonomous reality of the story or, you know, if these characters are existing in some, in some form, um, to see them at all, you have to, you have to go through that humor. At least that, that was always the kind of sense I had of, of Gaddis. Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, something I'm, I'm really interested in and what really struck me on this read through, I've, I read the, the novels like 15 years ago. So, and I just returned to them with the galleys here. Um, but what struck me was um, Gaddis's very uh, patrician sensibility that, that animates both of these novels. Um, you know, they are novels of, of decadence. M most of Gaddis's characters fall victim to decadence or are participating in it in some way, whether that's vanity, you know, falsity, greed, drugs, whatever it may be. Um, and it's in some ways a, a very conservative and maybe even reactionary view of American culture. And I, I know Gaddis himself from reading his letters was temperamentally quite conservative. He was um, Spenglerian and he saw decadence and, and um, it, th throughout, throughout American culture. Um, and like Evelyn Waugh, who, who he loved before him, I think he kind of enjoys casting himself as the last aristocrat who's taking aim at the Philistines as they you know, charge, charge through the gate. Um, but I, I found this quote from um, his, his good friend, William Gass. Uh, he's, Gass thought, quote, the comic and satiric side of his work was attempting to save his version of his country. Um, and he thought he shared that with some of the Russians that, that Gaddis really loved. Um, and so I'm curious, what do you think Gaddis's hopes are for America or were for America? Um, does it feel to you that it, America is truly beyond hope or that there is something <laughs> there, beneath, you know, the great evening of his pessimism that's, that's worth pulling up or salvaging in some way? <laughs> I don't know, Tom, it looks like you might have a thought. No, yeah, I mean, well, I, I, it's kind of two questions. I mean, yes, certainly there is that paradox that, that you know, he's, he's this radical, um, you know, he, he's, he's formally radical. He's, 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 he's taking 
the American novel to places it has not been before. And yet there is a really patrician conservatism there. And again, we could, we could see this pattern in figures like T.S. Eliot, even someone like William Burroughs, you know, <laughs> always wore a suit and a tie and had some very, very conservative views, especially on gender politics. Um, and and uh, Ezra Pound, I mean, say no more, you know, the guy was a fascist, um, but, but, but again, a radically uh, revolutionary in a way. Um, writer and a very, very important one. So, so yes, there's, there's definitely that, that, that paradox at play. I mean, in terms of hope, yeah, again, no, I mean, he's, he's deeply pessimistic, but then, you know, the gest at the very end of the recognitions, um, Wyatt, the kind of hero, anti-hero, who's, who's had this condeed like kind of pilgrims, abject pilgrims, not even progress, regress through the book. He comes face to face with this kind of popular middle brown novelist in a, in a, in a, in a monastery or outside a monastery in Spain. And, and the American middle brown novelist is full of hope, looking for hope, looking for something spiritual that he can sell, package and sell to his readers to give them hope. And Wyatt is just like, no, screw that. <laughs> and the final, the final gesture, which I think is actually a, a really good one. He, he's, he's kind of ejected, physically ejected from the monastery and sent back out into the world. And he says, yes, this is the place to be, to live it and relive it again. I mean, it's the same gesture Proust makes, but it, but it seems more serious and sad and um, suffering. Um, but in a totally non-redemptive, non, you know, it's not really a Christian suffering. It's a kind of profane form of artistic suffering. We have to go back out. Things are, things are, things are screwed, but, but it, it, the ethical, not just aesthetic, but the ethical and political obligation is, is to go back out and do it all over again. It won't be any better, but you, know, you still just go, go back. I, I think that's an affirmation of sorts. It's a refusal to give up. I think that, that I mean, first of all, I think that it's, it's, I don't know very many people who write 800, 900 page books who um, are, truly have no hope. You know, you, you might do that once, but you don't do it a second time. And then you try to do it a third time. And you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I think that just in the fact of the book's existence, it says that this is the labor to which he's dedicated. And, and, and you know, though it sounds like a, a dodge of the question, I mean, I do think that, that he would say that, you know, that is sort of his ideal, his America is, is the speech, is the way that like the, 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 the talk kind of exists in, in his books. And I, I think one small step beyond that is that he has a, um, I think he's fascinated by fakery. He's fascinated by cheapness and he's fascinated by the compromises people will make, endlessly fascinated by it. And there was an element of um, what people, what you would call, it was called as patrician sensibility I, I actually think about it as um, he really, I believe, prided himself on being removed, on, um, on being separate, uh, because the separation between him and he and his characters, or the people that he's writing about, maybe the separation between him and every other person on the planet, really gave him the ability to see clearly. And uh, I, I there's so much, especially in his letters uh, when he was younger about um, the need to be clear and the desire to, to have clarity. And in a way, I think clarity was his hope, the ability to see the situation and not be deluded, not to fall for fakes, not to uh, be bamboozled, not to um, you know, allow yourself to be seduced into prostituting your talent or to doing less than you knew that you were able to do, to exchanging it for a buck to exchanging it for you know uh, uh, cheap regard, I think that 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 for him was um, that for him was hope. Uh, uh, if he could learn to resist these temptations, um, and he could put into a book 
the sort of uh, a clear-eyed view that comes from the clarity uh, of that resistance, then um, I think that, that that got him through, right? That saw him through. And, and, and if there is any, and I hate the idea of there being a lesson to learn, and I also hate the idea of you know, a prescription for a country, but it does seem that in, in this era of, um, of conspiracies and delusions, in this era where you know, no one seems to even believe there's something like selling out, right? Um, that it's that clarity that we're lacking and it's, it's precisely that standard of clarity that we need. Recognition. Yeah. <laughs> Lydia, any, any thoughts or? No, I have no, no thoughts. Okay. I've just, I've been just like floating on the stream of the words of these others yeah, no, here. Great responses for sure. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, next about um, the character of Jr. himself, the the, the eleven year old uh, child, and and you know center of this financial empire. You know, I think the the first time I read the the novels, um, you know, I noticed he, he was sort of a native rapaciousness, and what he what he rec what he represents um, a, a, as as an American subject. But I felt um, terribly sorry for him. Uh, this this read through. Um, he is essentially sort of a, a latchkey uh, child and they're, they're, don't have the quotes in front of me, but you know, his, he says something like, no one has ever given me anything before. And his, you know, his, his mother and father seem largely absent. Um, and so I, I wonder what, what your feelings are for, for this child who's, who's at the center of this whirling of, you know, garishness and vulgarity. And um, it, it, it's, it feels, it feels like, it should it should be some sort of a negative reaction, but uh, I, I found it amazing how Gaddis was able to, I don't know, build empathy within me for for a character who is you know loud, like I said, rapacious, somewhat vulgar. Um, what does that say about Gaddis's ability? And and I just really wanted to hear 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 what you think about uh, the character of Jr. as the child in the middle of this maelstrom of of activity. I don't know if anyone wants to. I always think of his just like his grubbiness, you know, his right. And and actually, I don't. I think it, uh, one of these. Well, I, so I read somewhere, maybe even on the back of this this reissue or something about that it says he's a. I don't know that he's um, uh, an entirely average child or something like that. I was like, what? You know, I don't. Well, not he's not. Then my children must be freaks. <laughs> Um, because in a way he's of course this a strange like idiot savant and mm -hmm. then also he's just this sort of quintessentially I don't know boy every man from uh, I don't know it's just grubby hands and he's and, and he's portrayed this way as sort of but he's also and but he's all he is poignant you know he is actually sort of heartbreaking also and and lonely and you know you constantly as you see him tagging along he, he seems like a, sort of maybe like a almost like a mini me of some ego ego projection of Gaddis's or something like that to me sometimes because he really is um, he does have this like extraordinary curiosity right this kid in a way and then also zero curiosity like he's a strange he's a conundrum of um, yeah rapaciousness I guess or voraciousness or something appetite but it's also appetite for knowledge like he he is interested sure you know it's it's single-minded right it's a single-minded hunger but he is curious and and also sort of um dismissive and uh yeah i don't know and closed off to to stimuli that that don't serve him directly in certain ways i don't know i, I think he He's a, a complex and kind of excellent character myself. Tom, Joshua. I think the fact that he's a child is, is, is really important. And I mean, you know, Gaddis is very interested in, in the structure of the family, but they're always um, broke, well, not just broken families. They're, they're, it's a world of orphans. I mean, no one connect. There's a wonderful scene in the recognitions where a long lost father and son uh, have arranged a meeting, but then a forger turns up, misrecognizes 
the son uh, as a contact he's meant to pass some fake notes to and then the father misrecognizes someone else and they're all there's all, a comedy of errors swirling around this this hotel lobby at, with forgery at the, at the heart of it right and then fake currency so these whole bonds of um a familial you know natural bonds are replaced with with a uh, you know, mon exchangeable fake monetary signs. And I think in, you know, maybe you have to see JR in that in that context as well. He's like the the er orphan <laughs> that that is that is at the heart of um, you know, the American kind of social structure, I, I guess perhaps would, mm -hmm. would would be a way he's he's framing it. Well I, um, I always, you know, I mean I think that 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 that's a very um what that point of the, the, the orphanhood of, of, of JR, to me, I, I always read him as um, the quintessential American character. And in fact, maybe even an embodiment of America itself, you know. Huck Finn, um, Tom Sawyer. Right, you know, right, but, 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 but very much, in, but, but, but when I say an embodiment, I also kind of mean in a historical way, it's a country that is younger than the other countries, you know. Um, kind of is only curious about the things that can help him and that he wants, right? Is not very, uh, is, is enormously confident and, and it's just running on pure confidence, but not a lot really to back it up. And, and a lot of times has, you know, because as a child and there's a central almost amorality of children, it's this idea of he does something because it is possible, because it's legally possible or because a system allows it with no notion that, that there are social codes that would, you know, that, that, that would cause other people to read him as a bore or as, 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 as a rapacious, obnoxious psychopath or sociopath at some point. And, and I, I think it's that, it's that, it's that amorality and, and the ability, the inability to recognize um, the way in which he's perceived by other people. And yet, uh, when he finds out how other people perceive him is very quick to be wounded, but also needs to win someone over very quickly. Can't not be liked in a way. That strikes me as, as, um, as deeply American. And what's interesting is, is that to found that in, in what you, you both were saying, which is some notion of being an, uh, an orphan, you know, some notion of, you know, not being, being a victim of, 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 uh, of being raised without standards, whatever those standards are, or raised to a standard, um, yeah, m makes, I think, a reader sympathetic. Absolutely. Great. Um, I, I want to stick with, with JR and, and talk about um, another major theme in the novel, which is uh, entropy. Um, and the, the somewhat failed writer in, in JR, uh, Jack Gibbs, or one of them, Jack Gibbs, says, uh, quote, order is simply a thin, perilous condition we try to impose on the basic reality of chaos. And there are these um, examples of entropy uh, throughout the novel. Uh, people are always tripping and spilling uh, paper and coins out of bags and pockets. Um, language is itself sort of used up and its meaning has been um, almost entirely depleted. Um, there's the sort of fundamental entropic zone of the 96th Street apartment uh, that Gibbs shares with uh, Edward Bass, the composer, and defies any kind of ordering process. It's just filling up with junk and letters and magazines and mops and um, it's the, it's the headquarters of JR's uh, family of companies. Um, and this got me thinking about, you know, entropy is obviously, um, it, it's endemic to postmodern literature. It's, it's everywhere through Pynchon, Coover, McElroy, et cetera. I wanted to ask you, um, how do you think Gaddis differentiates himself um, in, in his use of entropy uh, from among these other postmodern titans that I've mentioned? And do you think they're pursuing similar aims in some sense? Or what do you think makes Gaddis unique uh, among these other giants? Give some time to consider. I don't know if anyone has a ready answer. Well, there's something in the, I mean, there is something, I can't really do like a comparative analysis of, of, of all these different writers sure. right now, but I will say that, you know, um, when I read Gaddis, I'm um, really quite lost. And I don't say this to discourage anyone 
who hasn't read Gaddis from reading Gaddis, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really, um, I don't know where I am. I don't always know who's speaking. Sometimes I have to, you know, pick my way back to figure out, like, I don't even know when I'm, I'm, I'm moving from one place to another. I'm suddenly there, you know, <laughs> and everything sort of, um, combines in this odd way and there's a constant so you're you're constantly sort of um uh what's the word it's a it's a it can be sort of a a jittery thing in that you're displaced you find yourself displaced all of a sudden in the narrative from one set of speakers or characters or place or time to another and have to uh reorient yourself but at the same time the um it may be a jittery sort of uh, um, calculation in terms of whatever reality you're, you're trying to sit your, situate yourself in, but it's conducted f fluidly, you know, because so, that's the way he writes. So, you're, so, so it's a sort of like fluid form um, containing um, a, a very um, uh, fragmented, um, uh, I don't know, narrative reality, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word. So that there is something, you know, intrinsically sort of um, chaotic and also, um, but, but, but also curiously um, liquid. It's a sort of about, about the way that Gaddis's novels move forward. I don't know if that makes any sense to anyone. Mm, I, yeah. I, I have this, this idea that you know, especially entropy as it's as it's used in in at least a few of the writers that that you mentioned, Dustin. You know, has to do in my mind with um, where they associate it with sort of the end of history, the end of the world. Um, obviously, you know, entropy coming from physics and uh, being, I think, related in the minds of a number of those novelists to things like the atomic bomb. Uh, nuclear destruction, the idea that the kind of you know, the, the universe is sort of um, uh, it's either running out of energy, right, or it's going to uh, uh, or it's going to be all rendered into uh, uh, or the energy will all disappear, right, and, and it all seems to be apocalyptic in in the way that it's used, especially I think in, in Pinchon, right, but um, but Gaddis, you know, I don't know that I would use the word entropy with him because it's far. I mean, for lack of a better word, it's just far funkier. It's not about like, you know, the, the heat death of the universe or like the Holocaust of a thousand suns. It's, it's like, a, it, it, it's like 20,000 issues of old defunct magazines piled up in the corner under like a cracked ceiling and water's coming down. You know, it's, it's, it's just old broken LPs. It's, uh, it's, it's his like player piano rolls that just, you know, pile up to the ceiling. It's just, it's, it's real physicalized junk. And it's the junk or the products of culture. It's the painting that's leaned against the wall that might be a Michelangelo or might just be a knockoff, you know? It's uh, um, th that, it's the, you know, you, you, to fancy way to say it might be the artifacts of a culture or the, um, the manufactured products of a culture and how these manufactured products that are made in machines, like our books are printed in China and then put on boats and then sent over here and then sent out on trucks. You know, all of these systems that, that make this cultural product that we call a book. Um, I think that, 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 that he's interested in these products and these systems that make these products and move these products. And so I just feel him as, as much more earthy, frankly, and, and much more, at least um, for me, and also kind of growing up, uh, in the Northeast, you know, where I grew up, like it, it, to me, it's, it's, it's very relatable as, as, you know, the garage or the attic. And, um, and in that way, I found it, uh, 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 it was a lot closer to my experiences and sensibilities. Um, you know, my fear was, I, I, and maybe this is, you know, maybe I'll, I'll be proven wrong, but we'll all be proven wrong. But I was always more afraid of becoming the old guy in the garret surrounded by all of the books than I was by dying in a nuclear war. <laughs> I, I think at the same time there is, I mean, he, he's a theological writer. And I think, um, I mean, 
in, you know, interestingly, the person who really put entropy brought the concept to, to the attention of all these writers. And I think in JR, the science teacher is, is quoting him directly in, that, in the lesson where he uses the term entropy is, is Norbert Wiener, right? And um, uh, in the human use of human beings and all over his whole, all his writings on cybernetics, his entropy is the kind of really central concept. And I think this is where Gaddis and Pynchon and all the others get it from. Um, Maxwell's demon and everything. But but Wiener is, he's a very theological writer too. I mean, he keeps quoting St. Augustine and, and talking about a Manichaean universe where it's just running itself down like a clockwork toy that's just wound out to the end. And I think certainly in, you know, like a late novel, like Carpenter's Gothic, there's a real, it's like the end of The Confidence Man by Melville. It's, you, you get the sense, this is kind of the end. It's the end of the universe. There's a character called Candles or Cans Less. It's like and the light's going out. <laughs> it's like the wax has run right down to it. So, um, so I, I think no, I totally ag agree with what, with what Joshua is saying, but I, 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 think, I think both are true. I think there is a kind of um, metaphysical kind of argument being made about, about um, yeah, yeah, maybe it's not thermonuclear heat death, it's just, it's just a more, uh, you know, running out of the candle. <laughs> and yet, even amidst this, there's a, there's a kind of, some kind of invocation to, yeah, to recognize the patterns on the wall, to, to I don't know, to, to make some kind of speech act, to, you know, to write. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, it does. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the, the questions coming in from the community. It looks like we have quite a few. So this is going to be my last one before I turn it over to some community questions. Um, Tom, uh, in, your, in your new introduction to the, the recognitions, um, you, write, you actually referenced this earlier. You write, um, quote, it immediately seemed a contemporary book, one that spoke to our age of pattern recognition software, QR codes, and fraud mm. in high office all around the world. <laughs> um, I think that's you know, exactly right. And I think it's kind of a cheap trick to saddle a writer with uh, prescience, which it just seems like an inadequate thing to call Gaddis. But um, I, I wanted to ask you all, really, to what extent you feel like Gaddis anticipated this world and, and how, I don't know, what do you think you would make of um, extremely online life, social media? Um, I, I, that's a, a novel I wish I could read, but um, you know, I feel like we're now entering sort of an, an, an end point from the kind of welter of, of noise of image and, and language that, that JR started or was, you know, was representing to, to where we are now. I just, I wonder what you, what do you think Gaddis would make of our world and how, how well maybe his work um, anticipated what we're living through? Tom, go for it. I mean, it, yes, I think it, it does anticipate our world, but it also looks back to, you know, um, uh, the enlightenment. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the point I try to make in, the in, in my introduction is that he's that like a dowser with a stick. He's, he's picked out fault lines that are absolutely central to Western culture and always will be. For example, the, the, the fetish of authenticity that I was talking about earlier, this goes all the way back to the Greeks and it continues through to yoga classes <laughs> and, uh, and conspiracy theories online. Um, you know, the true, the true, and, and, and contemporary forms of fascism, you know, the, the authentic Americans, the true British people, and so on. Um, so, so, you know, but yeah, the, the, the question you, you raise about, yeah, the, the, the hullabaloo, the dialogue, the, the polyglottal crossfire of, of the, the chat room is, is, is interesting. I mean, um, but again, I'd see that as part of a, a continuity. I mean, we could think about something like I know Gertrude Stein or or Jules Lafogue, or <laughs> you know, there's a there's a babbling going on, and 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 I and I think yeah, and it, it does kind of anticipate lots of the digital realm, um, but but the digital realm in that in that sense wouldn't be something absolutely categorically new. It would just be a kind of built on the 
on the foundations of these other you know, discourse networks that, that we have always lived in and, and uh, navigated. That's, that's all I got. <laughs> that's great. Good. Josh or Lydia, anything else? Or I'm going to move to uh, community questions if we're, if we're okay with that. Sure. It looks like there's a lot of questions. So it we looks might like we've got a lot. Well anyway. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Let's see. I'm opening them right now. Give me just one moment. Um, it looks like uh, some have been upvoted uh, more than others. Um, I'm going to read the ones that, that have been uh, upvoted by our, our great audience today. So this one comes from um, Mike Emmons. He says, this has been touched on a little. Critics lump Gaddis in with the postmodernists, but his reading tastes, from what I understand, ran more to rancid, dark satire. Play it as it lays, a handful of dust, Miss Lonely Hearts. Franzen suggested this implies that Gaddis was a hypocrite, that he was writing novels that he wouldn't want to read. Having read the recognitions and JR, this makes total sense to me. He's got more in common with satirists and black humorists than with postmodernists. Do you all think he's, being, he's been miscategorized? Yeah, I mean, I, I one, I, I'm gonna forget where this, where this is from and I'm sure when uh, uh, someone who's watching is gonna, is gonna know better than, than, than I am, but it's, I was always struck by, by Gaddis um, really liking the novels of, of Saul Bellow. And uh, you reviewed him. Uh, uh, I, they, he, he wrote letters to him. He, he sort of, you know, and, and expressed, you know, interest in, in even in, in, you know, in novels of Bellows that, 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 um, th that many others didn't, like More Die of Heartbreak, for example. And, um, and one of the things that, that, that I think that they have in common and I, I, you know, and, and Bellow, I think pretty obviously, you know, shouldn't be lumped in with a lot of the people that you're calling, you know, postmodernists, is really that they they were people who were writing um, about a certain instability or within a certain instability they found in English. I think one of the projects of modernism, right, is is essentially to stylize the the narrative or to stylize whether it's a narrative telling the story or it's a third person sort of omniscient narrative, you know, modernism really was, uh, uh, and I'm speaking like practically or how it looked on the page, it was an attempt to really stylize that, that expression um, because it was a feeling that there wasn't any more, uh, not that there ever was, but there wasn't any more some authentic or common or mutual uh, neutral expression in English in order to like uh, 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 narrate prose. You know, you don't have this almost, um, um, you know, in my mind, it's the example of, you know, Ivanhoe is a great example, right? You have Walter Scott and it's, you know, what is it? In the pleasant district of Merry England, they're extended a time to an ancient forest. And it's this kind of, you know, very, um, very basic storytelling prose. And then the dialogue in, in Ivanhoe is everyone saying, are thine free this evening? Are, you know, art thou, dost thou want this? You know, and, and so you have this dialogue, which is archaic, and you have this narrative prose, this expository prose that, that at that time was kind of contemporary. And now it's sort of uh, 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 the opposite, where you have uh, most novels, you go to a bookstore, you buy a novel, and you know, back when we could go to bookstores, and you open it, and, um, and in fact, the expository prose is like really old fashioned, you know, the two people, you know, met on the heath, and he said, what's up? Yo, nothing. You know, and it's like, and, and it's the complete opposite. And, and I think, you know, modernism really saw a crisis of, of how to stylize the, uh, the you know, the narrative. And, um, and one of the ways that, that American writers really did this was recognizing that not only, you know, is there no stable English, but that English is probably, as an American English is, is probably the most unstable language there is in which there's a novel tradition because it, it, it's so um, heterogeneous. There are so many people and so many places and so many other languages coming into English and it sucks it up like a sponge that this became uh, their response to the modernist crisis of how to deal with, a, um, with an English that isn't common 
uh, to, you know, among everyone, it, it's to stylize it through voice and to bring those voices in. And, and, and I, I would put him with, with that tradition, which I think is a, a kind of a, a more secret tradition in American literature and one that's less, um, that's less well known. Did everyone just drop out of that? I, <laughs> that that really makes sense. I think Dustin yeah. Des, Dustin sort of uh, disappeared. I've forgotten what the um, <clears throat> what the actual question was. Now that we're I will take over while Dustin, Dustin tries to get back in. Um, can okay. you lump him in, Lydia? It was it was can you put Gaddis together with the other oh. kind of postmodernists? Um, because it seems like the reading that he did and the writers that he whom he appreciated weren't necessarily of that tradition. Well, I, I just have to say that I don't think what you read and what you write being different in any way makes you a hypocrite. So I, I don't even see what, what that connection, I, I don't really understand uh, the logic there. Um, why must you read what you write? You know, do, do you also have to, you know, um, date someone who looks like you? I don't know. I just, I don't really understand the, do what's you? being, <laughs> you know? I mean, what, what is being asserted with that, that, I, I think that, the, that accusation of hypocrisy? I think that the, the motivator for that question is drawing a distinction between the satirist and black humorists, such as, um, you know, Miss Lonely Hearts, Play It As It Lays, A Handful of Dust were brought up all, um, mm -hmm. versus the postmodernist. I think that that was the distinction that was trying to be created. Yeah. Mm. Just sort of where to, where to put him. Yeah. yeah. Tom, did you have any thoughts? No, I'm I'm listening. I mean, it's uh, I, I'm never good at putting people into boxes. I mean, categories like that because everything's so porous. You know, everything, okay. everything kind of bleeds all over. And um, I was I, by my bedside when I was reading the recognitions. I also had a uh, Damon Runyon stories, and then there's a character called called uh, Basil Valentine, and one of in one, of, uh, in one of Runyon's stories, kind of 20, 20 years before, um, before Gaddis. And I mean, it, maybe he knew, maybe he didn't, maybe he knew, but he'd forgot. But I mean, it's interesting. You think of these things as totally different genres, but things just travel and migrate and, and overlap. And I think, I, I think perhaps, you know, what kind of genre something is, isn't, isn't really the most interesting kind of aspect of it. And also, you know, of course, he can be satirical within sort of postmodernism. He does, he does have, um, he does sort of have a certain. So he he seems to have been, and and you both, you know, both Joshua and Tommy know so much more, I think, biographically about Gaddis than I do. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but he seems to have been quite a collector, quite a quite a hoarder, you know, sort of a collector of bits of language from different parts of life, you know. Much as J.R. collected his ridiculous um, things that he sent off for, uh, Gaddis himself seems to have really, like I know it for a frolic of his own, he just had this massive sort of library of, you know, legal, legal um, briefs and other kinds of documents and stuff like that. And I imagine it wasn't dissimilar for J.R. with the stock market stuff back then, um, you know, newspaper clippings and all this kind of thing. Um, so he was, I guess, sort of, sort of a bit pastiche in his in his habits of collecting and appropriating, right? Um, maybe I don't know. And and so in that sense, uh, you know, appropriately maybe postmodern, but still it seems to me like he he had such a that the, I mean, and again I'm not I'm not a, a, a literary theorist or anything like that, but he he does seem to have had certain certain qualities that I really do associate with modernism or high modernism as well, you know, very sort of um, moral, um, sort of very strong sort of um, implicit opinions about morality and uh, aesthetics and almost, uh, you know, non-relativity of, um, I don't know, sort of, of montology or something like that. Anyway, but I, I defer to those who know more about his, his biography. Great. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Sorry, my internet, my internet dropped out. So I'm actually on my, my iPhone now joining in from a different source here. Um, I'm 
accessing the questions here. Um, why do you think very little attention is paid to Gaddis as a prose stylist apart from his dialogue? He writes such wonderful sentences uh, and the narration in JR, though there is very little of it, is simply gorgeous. What is your take on Gaddis's style apart from his master's voices? I said, I, 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 yeah, okay. go ahead, go ahead. No, you go. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, I think I think it's 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 that he was, you know, I, I don't, you know, I never know what's to account for someone being unappreciated for something that they are great at. You know, many writers that who are who are wonderful at many things, and and usually the things that are they're celebrated for uh, don't necessarily uh, uh, they're not the things that I necessarily celebrate them for, right? But but mm -hmm. but but I I just I do think it's that it's 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 that he was really attuned to the relationship between the things that come out of people's mouths and the things that he as a novelist are making people see. And, and, and I think that to be attuned to that relationship, to have that sensitivity to that relationship between how a character expresses themselves or how a character expresses themselves and how sort of God's eye or whatever that is, or the perspective point of view of a character you know, especially the ones that hand off points of view of characters, which is the the narration in JR, is um, is is the mark of you know of of what you know was typically called right a stylist. But I think more importantly, it's 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 the mark of someone who morally thinks about what uh, what is the responsibility of um, of a person who controls these uh, these figments, right? To 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 invent these mouths and then to move them and to put something in them what is the responsibility of the intelligence behind it all um is it you know to show uh, uh his hand that he knows uh what he's doing and to kind of do a, a metafictional wink no is it uh to show that you know he's smart and he can just dump a lot of information on you like he did a lot in the recognitions uh, and just, no i i think it's really that um he's going to kind of show you how uh, almost a godlike novelist looks down and sees his people moving. And that's why you have that, that, that amazing, you know, brief bits of, 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 of descriptive prose in JR, which really just show someone moving from one place to another um, by, by, by essentially inhabiting their eyes and, uh, uh, and letting them kind of see, see the people in front of them before we're turned over to their voices. And I think that that's a, um, uh, uh, it's from a novelistic, from a purely practical point of view, it's a, it, it's a very counterintuitive thing to do. Um, and, but I think it's, it's, it's absolutely, you know, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. The, the prose style and the recognitions I think is, is, you know, he was so good at writing quote unquote good prose uh, that, that, that he might've gotten bored of it, frankly. Um, I, it seems it seems like his fluency in that regard, especially if you read yeah. his letters, is just so remarkable. Where he could just write a a sort of perfectly torqued, multi clause sentence that that has all of its balances, right? I mean th that for him was like breathing almost. And and I think at a certain point, you know, every writer who I, I think becomes um, the best version of, the, of 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 themselves and makes the best use of their talents is someone who doubts uh, what comes easily to them. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. And I mean, you know, by the end, by ag agape, I think that maybe this comes back to entropy. I mean, there's a kind of falling apart, not just of the universe, but of 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 the the the, the agency of the writer, of the figure of the writer. I mean, there's this by agape agape. He's literally disintegrating. I mean, his body is for the, the characters, and, and perhaps Gaddis is too. But the character's body is falling apart as he lies in this hospital bed, and he's got all these pieces of paper, these parchments like his skin, that are also falling apart and falling over, and shredding. And and the, and the prose kind of works like this. It keeps jumping around as though as though these are just notes being gathered and lost. And then, and then you know, think of a frolic of one's own. I mean, you've got all these different kind of texts, and and they just kind of say, oh, where is that text? No, stop that one. Get me this one. Read read me this letter. Find this letter. And they can't find anything, and everything interrupts everything else. It's this kind of managed disintegration. Um, which, 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 um, it's kind of, yeah, it's like maybe in Beckett or something, you get a similar thing towards the end. Um, 
unnameable or whatever, but, but I, I think there's something very interesting about this, a kind of abject mastery. <laughs> it, 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 sure, in the recognitions, it is kind of controlling and godlike. By the end, there's this kind of surrender to a process of powerlessness, which is nonetheless incredibly well managed. That's the paradox and produces this amazing kind of um, prose. Um, so I can't see it now, but before I dropped off, I saw the question that was leading all other questions was actually for, for people who have never read Gaddis, what, what would the panelists recommend as the best starting point or your own personal favorite uh, you know, book as a starting point among Gaddis's works? I would say uh, Agape Agape, uh, um, not just because it's the shortest, um, but it is, um, but because it it's um, the most essayistic in a way, and I and it speaks. I think um, so. It speaks in a in a more contemporary idiom, and I think it speaks to um, to anxieties. Uh, to many of the anxieties that are in the recognitions, uh, especially, um, but it speaks to uh, uh, their, uh, a more contemporary form of them, perhaps. It's, it's, it's really about, uh, you know, it's a, a writer who sort of resembles Gaddis, um, who is dying. Um, he's taking uh, a lot of prednisone, I believe, and he's just has this monologue where he's attempting to put together his uh, essay or dissertation or treatise on the the role of the player piano, the idea of you know the piano with the punched rolls that kind of plays itself and doesn't require a human to make music from it, and it's it's about uh, I mean it's about many things, but at its heart is what happens when um, when technology um, sort of usurps all uh, human capacities to both make art. And uh, uh, and to reproduce art, and uh, what is you know what is lost when a generation that you know if you wanted to hear music you had to buy the the part of share you have to buy the sheet music and you'd have to learn how to play it on the piano yourself, and then what's lost between that and a generation that can buy the record and listen to it, and then you know and or listen to it on the radio or listen to it on streaming services and or or you could just have a piano and you, you turn it on, you plug it in and it, and, it, and it starts playing for you. Is there a point at which, you know, art um, can be appreciated by these machines too and we don't need humans at all to even be around as an audience. Um, I think that it's a, it's a remarkable distillation. And it's also one of the few books where when a writer really radically changes, not only style and scope toward the end of their lives, it usually doesn't work out too well for them. Um, and this is this is one of the uh, uh, this is probably in mind the, the the truly great exception. And I, I believe that he you know he attributes that change to his discovery of of Bernhard and uh, of Thomas Bernhard and 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 the monologue owes a lot to to, to Bernhard in that. So yeah. Yeah, I might actually just start with his most recent work and just read back. To, toward his youth if I were doing it for the first time because I always hope anyway as a writer that I improve as I go forward and perhaps he would have hoped the same. Also, you know, the old, the younger books are shorter as Josh said. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if you want to like gentle introduction, you know, Carpenter's Gothic and, and Frolic of His Own might be a better place to start then. Definitely not the recognitions. I wouldn't start with the recognitions personally, although I did when I was young. Also, there's a kind of, it's, it, there's this running joke. It's like an in-joke running through his books. In, in almost all of them, there's at least one character who, who is determined to write this great tome on the history of the player piano. And then finally, you know, after all these <laughs> big fat thousand page books, he produces virtually on his deathbed, this kind of 92 page little pet shrift. <laughs> It's, it's funny. It's like like in a Thomas Bernhard book where you're always meant to be writing the book that you never actually write. I mean, Agape Agape is that book that his whole oeuvre has been straining towards. And it's this, this uh, you know, the mountain's path and out comes the mouse and it's the mouse. 
All right, we have a question here from Ryan Farrell. Um, it says, uh, a question for Joshua, given Book of Numbers, although any of our, our panelists can answer this, uh, considering that Wyatt Gwyan and Jack Eigen are based more or less on Gaddis himself, could you address the subject of fictive doppelgangers? Basil's observation that Wyatt uses a mirror to paint himself into his forgeries really highlighted this for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I think, I think Gaddis would have never done anything as dumb as making a character called William Gaddis in one of his books, you know? So, so already that gives him the significant advantage. Uh, I don't, I don't, uh, uh, he was always very, uh, Gaddis was always very important to me because of the talk and because of the, of the talkiness and because of the openness to language, the, the sense of, um, of identity or, or projecting the author into the text. I actually saw him um, as someone who uh, was resistant to that in many ways. I think he would flirt with it um, as a kind of a wink at the reader, but it was always done in a, um, you know, in a satiric way and in a way that is testing a reader's projection into the text. I think he's constantly projecting, you know, what a, what a reader like himself would see in the text. And maybe his greatest presence there is that, um, uh, is that the, the, a lot of the jokes and a lot of the humor is there for him. And it's there for, or him as his ideal reader. And um, uh, in other words, these are books of people talking and talking and talking and talking and saying hilariously funny things but none of the characters are ever laughing at each other. They're never laughing at what the other characters are saying. It's, it, the, the laughter is purely reserved for, uh, for the reader uh, and, and, uh, and one suspects for Gaddis himself. And um, I, so, so that maybe is, 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 is something I took from uh, uh, or something I learned from, from, from Gaddis. But in terms of you know projecting himself, with the exception of again of that last book, which is pretty obviously you know trying to to, to be portrayed as a version of of, of, of Gaddis himself um, on his deathbed, um, I, I actually saw him as someone who was uniquely resistant to um, metafictional gestures, especially of like let's say the the Cooper and Barth school. All right, I think, I think Hal is the man from behind the curtain is gonna come and uh, wrap the show up, I believe. Yep, thank you, Dustin. Um, you thank you, it. you guys, that was fabulous. Thank you, Tom, Lydia, Josh, um, especially Dustin for hanging in there and, and getting back in with us and, and keeping the, the ship afloat. Um, I made a joke that we have, you know, knock on wood, we hadn't had anybody lose internet connection the entire time we've been doing virtual events, but of course the Gaddis panel was going to tend towards entropy. So here we are. Um, but again, uh, to the audience, um, I posted a link to the books in the chat. Um, you can check those out. Both of them are on sale now. You can buy them from Community Bookstore who put this event on if you would like, that would be great. Um, and otherwise, uh, you know, thank you again to NYRB for helping us put together this uh, series over the last couple of months. Um, everyone have a great holiday, whatever that means for you, whatever that's gonna look like for you. Um, again, to Tom, to Lydia, to Josh, and to Dustin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank you for picking up and rereading some of these massive books. Um, and otherwise, I'm wishing everybody well. Be safe, be healthy, stay in touch. Thank Good you. night. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.